So we have a few options as far as how we want to implement this. Um, so Blink Scheduler has task queues, and the tasks that are yielding will have come from one of these task queues, right? Um, the scheduler has multiple priorities. So just as an example of how we could, you know, implement uh, yield is, so the, the task is represented, uh, the task that's running that's going to post a continuation is D1. Um, it's at default priority. Um, this, um, in order to implement continuation, when it decides to yield, we can, what we're going to do is post a task and that task is going to resolve the promise eventually. And we can reuse existing Blink um, scheduler architecture um, that will automatically run higher priority work um, as long as we put it in the right task queue, in the right place. So we have a couple options of what we can do. Um, we can put it in the next highest priority. Um, this is something that actually, um, which I call the poor man's yield, we, we do this internally for um, script, I think. There's some maybe some uh, JavaScript processing that we, we actually do this for right now. Um, this gives you, you know, close semantics, um, not quite right. And it really does, it does depend on the priorities. Um, but if there's a task that's running that posts, you know, additional higher priority work, what would happen is the continuation would run basically at that priority before other things, right? So in this example, H2 um, is queued when H1 starts running. Um, so we get the run order of D1's continuation kind of wedged in between. Um, it's not quite what we want. We What we want semantically, or at least what's really clean conceptually, is if when a task yields, it um, yields to everything that's higher priority, including stuff that gets generated along the way. Um, so for this, what we'd have to do from a scheduling perspective, um, or one thing that we could do, is kind of wedge it um, at the front of that task queue, kind of make that task queue more of like a stack and push it to the front. Um, and this would allow us to get that positioning that we want and it lets all the high priority work and anything that it generates um, kind of run before. This, um, people are really scared of putting an API that's going to do this. It can be dangerous um, if it's if it's abused. And this is what we'll talk about next is this API in general is a little bit frightening. Um, like we really do want to incentivize people to, to yield um, and we make it really ergonomic to do that. But it's also really ergonomic to starve the world. Right. There's um, if we look at these examples, um, you know, in, in this option here, we're going to we're always going to starve anything that's lower priority. Um, so the default priority task queue, which is where most of our stuff runs at normal default priority, um, could be indefinitely starved by a bad while true loop, like in that example. Um, so it's no different in this in this case. Um, in this case, we we also starve everything. So the post to a higher priority and post to the front of the same, the original task queue, um, both can lead to starvation. So we're actually exploring a, a, a third option right now, um, which is to kind of separate the, where these continuations go. Um, so one thing that we might be able to do is isolate them. So rather than posting you know, to existing task queue, we make a new task queue just for continuations that we, give a, that we have a little bit more control over. Um, we can think of this either as, we can think of this as a priority that's kind of wedged in between high, like these, these two priorities, just for continuations. So as long as the app isn't abusing it, if, it you know, if the yields don't go on for too long, then we can let it finish with the semantics that we expect. Um, Another, but we could also make it throttleable, and this would allow some other things um, at lower priorities to run, so that we don't starve the world. Um, we're not exactly sure how we're going to implement this yet, and this is something that we could do. We could have a discussion about, um, but this is one of the options that we thought of. Um, the The prototype for Yield is still a work in progress. Um, um, Nate's working on a patch, so love to you know hear your thoughts about some of these options. Um, but one thing that we think is important um, is starting, like we want to origin trial this to see how this, this API works for folks, um, but we don't want to, you know, give the semantics where you can starve and people expect that they, there will be nothing else that can, that can come in between, you know, the continuation. Um, so we think it's important to start with an option that does the throttling right up front just to make sure the worst case scenario here is if we add this later on, one, it's probably going to be spec breaking, and two, it might just disincentivize people again and they stop yielding, which is also bad. Um, so we kind of want to get this up, um, you know, get this correct up front. Okay. Um, 
so the next API we're working on is scheduler.post task. And this is all about um, priority-based scheduling. Um, so just really quick, um, you know, you, user space schedules, they have their own notion of priority. Um, this helps user experience. You want to do the things that are going to impact user experience the most first. Um, but they can't control everything on the page. Um, you know, you could even have multiple schedulers that are both trying to do this. And without a shared notion of, notion of priority, it's really hard for things that want to cooperate um, to get ordering right that's best for user experience. Um, it's also, you know, difficult or impossible for, you know, to communicate that priority outside of the <laughs> scheduler boundary um, for other things on the page or for, you know, within the browser. We just have no idea, you know, a task, one JavaScript task that's posted versus another one what the relative importance is as far as user experience. Um, right now, really the best that we have, or sorry, what we have right now for web priorities, um, apps can, you know, they can choose not to yield. This is essentially the highest priority because we won't interrupt them. Um, run micro tasks, which isn't exactly much better. Uh, we don't get a scheduling opportunity from the browser's perspective. Um, you can run RAF and people will abuse this kind of to get a higher priority because, you know, it's separate, separately schedulable um, as far as the scheduler is concerned. And we often will give this a higher priority, especially when input is you know, triggered. Um, the very bottom of this, you have request cycle callback. And this is really the first API that's designed to give you an explicit notion of priority. And this is, you know, doesn't tell you when something is important, it tells you when something isn't. Um, and then in between that is where most script runs. Um, the way things are spec, the UA has, um, has control over how they want to order things from different task sources. Um, you know, so set timers go into one, post message goes into another. So browser could theoretically do that. Don't know if much, um, you know, in the way of, of actually doing that in practice. The Blink scheduler, there's modulo a couple experiments. We group everything just as one priority. So what you end up with is that, um, you know, if you yield, um, you know, you kind of go to the end of this big bucket, but there's also no way, you know, if you're if you're just posting a task to say that this really is important. Um, so what we want to do is add some notion of priority. Um, and we'll talk about this if we have time at the end here, um, how these will actually integrate with everything else. Um, but we're planning to add, um, and this is what post has does, it adds an explicit notion of priority that you can queue work with that the browser can then use to make scheduling decisions. Okay. So there are two main problems um, or two main classes of problems. There are a ton of sub problems that emerge. Um, and this is what I would want to use the next session to, to talk about for folks that are interested. Um, but two main problems that come up are API shape. So yes, great, we have priorities. How do we expose them? Um, and this is a super interesting problem that we're not going to go into in great detail here. Um, but this comes down to a lot of how what task model we want to support. And then the second thing that I do want to talk about here is the priority semantics. Um, how do the priorities actually work? Um, and there's three separate questions that come up uh, with regard to this. So we'll talk about the basic API shape, just so you have an idea. The basic API shape that we're using right now um, is really simple. Post a task, get a promise. Um, the promise represents the results of the task. Um, and so you can call scheduler.posttask and give it um, you know, a callback. And you can optionally at the bottom give it a priority. It defaults to the default or normal priority that behaves similarly to like set timeout or post message. Um, so just with that context in mind, um, I thought we'd talk a little bit um, implementation-wise how this works, how this integrates with the Blink scheduler, because um, that's kind of where things happen. Um, so each document, uh, there's a frame scheduler associated with it, right? Each document. Um, also, we'll have a window.scheduler um, associated with it, right? So the document is kind of the link between the frame scheduler, which is the entry into the Blink scheduler that makes these decisions, um, and to user space code. So the frame scheduler right now, it manages sets of task queues. Um, we, you know, we will use different task queues depending on you know, certain attributes of whether or not um, the task is, is throttleable or freezable. But, um, Really, its job is just to make scheduling decisions based on these task queues and all tasks that user space um, will queue through, like I said, timeout, post message, et cetera, go into one of these. Um, so what we're adding is this web scheduling task queue. So each of these priorities um, 
high on the bottom will kind of map to one of these web scheduling task queues. Web scheduling task queue is just a wrapper around a main thread task queue. It's really a thin layer around a main thread task queue. And the language that kind of like links them all together is the web scheduling priority. Um, so that priority is what I showed on the earlier screen, high, default, low, um, immediate. And the questions that then arise is how exactly do these all integrate with the current, um, you know, current system that we have? So there are three questions and we just have a few minutes. So I will just kind of go through these quickly. Um, th three questions that we've thought a lot about, um, some that we have good answers on, some that we're still working on. Um, how do priorities work with respect to each other, right? So if we look at this, um, look back at this picture, like how just these task queues here, how should they interact? How does high versus low work? How is high versus default work, et cetera? Um, you know, we, we have a couple options here. We could leave some of this up to the UA because one of the questions that come up is what about anti-starvation? Like if, if there's only high um, and a few low, like should there, you know, should it be balanced in any such way? Um, we're thinking right now, um, just for this question, we want to spec these very rigidly. Um, and to do this, one of the things that our team has worked on um, with collaboration with London folks is disabling anti starvation we already have in the Blink scheduler. But what we're going with is a fixed order from highest to lowest, which gives web developers the, the best expectations. Um, and we think better compat across the web if these are rigidly spec'd. Um, Though we think there will be room for starvation pr prevention, um, but we want that to be web exposed. And we really want to ask the question as far as like, what is the goal of the starvation prevention? Is it an app starving itself or is it parts of the app starving itself as in like third party scripts, um, things that are out of control of the browser um, and sorry, and of the, the app developer? Um, because there might be different solutions here. So it's important that we think about that question. So the next uh, next question is how do priorities work uh, with respect to other tasks, non post task tasks? Um, so like I said, in this diagram, there are other main thread task queues. Um, we're adding some new ones. And how do these work together? So, you know, we can think of this as how does like a high priority task work? Um, what do we pick if we have a high priority task or like a post message? Um, and some of this is still TBD. The way we're planning to spec this for now um, is to let UAs have control over this because we recognize that there can be starvation here. Um, and it's kind of up to the UA to decide, you know, what is more important to run at that point in time. Like, you know, we don't want to spec it such that high priority work is always going to run before browser internal work. Um, so we're leaving some leeway in the spec. Mm -hmm. um, and as the spec is right now, you're, you're already allowed to um, prioritize different task sources. So we don't want to take that away. Um, so right now, there's just a mapping from the web, web scheduling priority. And this is one of the main things the frame scheduler does implementation wise is map that to a task queue priority in Blink. Um, and then under the hood, um, scheduling decisions will happen based on that priority. And right now, it's a very simple map mapping. We already had all the necessary priorities that we needed. So it's just kind of a thin layer around existing uh, priorities. One of the most interesting questions to me is how will the priorities work with respect to other DOM schedulers? So in the previous example, there was just um, you know, a single window.scheduler, but there could be others in the situation where there's iframes. Um, so the DOM scheduler is tied to the document. The interesting case here is when there are you know, multiple documents in the same process. Um, right now, modulo freezing, because that's frame-based, we really just treat them the same as if they were in the same um, window. Like there's there's no special prioritization that happens, um, but there's the potential for that. We've exper or the the London folks have experimented, scheduling folks have experimented in the past with you know deprioritizing frames um, based on you know certain heuristics, whether or not like it's an ad frame, maybe we would deprioritize it. So we could um, we could do something like that here um, to start with in V zero. We're not. Um, but we certainly could. So in this, this last slide here, um, how might priorities work um, with respect to other DOM schedulers? And I think there's a lot of potential here because the DOM scheduler itself becomes a boundary. We have a, some sort of, we have a unit of isolation. And when you have a unit of isolation, you can do different things. You can apply policies. Um, and you know, one such boundary are frames. Um, 
so you can imagine if we know if a developer tells us or we can infer that a priority is low, then we could just shift the internal priorities down of these you know lower priority schedulers. Um, and where this gets really interesting um, is these don't have to be the only units of isolation. And something that we could talk about in the next um, session if folks are interesting, but interested in this. But we, we've thought about this, and you can apply this wrapper in other places. Um, you could apply it to script, and then you could propagate that specific scheduler across um, tasks that it posts, so that you can kind of give a little bit of sandboxing around certain parts of your page. Um, and we think that there's some potential here for that. So we are out of time. Um, sorry about the technical problems, and thanks for the help getting this recorded. Um, a lot of stuff we didn't cover. I have some backup slides and some docs linked if folks are interested. Um, there is really interesting stuff around how and why we changed the API shape um, to be signal-based. Um, this goes into task models, um, which is an interesting topic. Um, propagating scheduler context. Um, we want to be able to actually propagate where a task was posted from across async boundaries. Um, this is going to enable a lot for developers. Um, and also, there's a lot of questions around what else can we prioritize. So that's what I have for now. There's some other things linked. And thank you very much for coming. Uh, I was wondering, so this is all linked with your Yes. Is there going to be an async of like post this thing that doesn't need link context? So you wait, sorry. Wait. I'm right behind you and it's hard to hear you. Yeah. Let's oh. just wait until he comes back. Yeah, let's give them a minute. I'm sure nobody over there can hear you. Yeah, okay, sorry. I was just having one on conversation. Um, hey, I'm uh, you look at inside the mic. I get to be loud. What? Inside the actor studio situation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Gavin. Yeah, I work on the scheduling stuff in base, uh, the multi-threaded stuff. So I'm wondering specifically, um, um, this is all main thread scheduling. Is there going to be a, a way to post an async task for something that doesn't need access to the DOM or anything? Mm, um, interesting question. Like heavy computation to this somewhere else in the slide. So they is that kind of similar to task workload? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Feel free to jump in, yeah. folks. On I don't know the JavaScript. I mean, maybe yeah. this already exists. Yeah, we've, yeah. we've run some experiments. Um, we decided to sort of back burner that for now, but it's okay. something that's sort of in our long term. Right. Basically, the workload is already a good API for you know dedicated workloads that okay, okay. to do heavy computation that will be on the main thread. And so, the specific ex prototyping we did was just kind of adding syntax to there and making it nice and easier to get it off. Um, but overall, I think yeah, we just sort of deprioritize that. Okay, okay, right. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. and so task workload also was a specific uh, attempt at uh, providing an API surface where it minimized message passing. Um, you, you, you post tasks with dependencies, and browser can then run grouped tasks in a given worker, and then you don't need to message pass for that group of tasks and that sort of thing, uh, which seemed to be one of the performance, big performance problems that just using straight workers does for the like non heavy use cases. If you're doing like a game engine, whatever workers is great already. Yes. <laughs> yeah, like basically, if you add, if you make it nice and easy, then the downside is this like you know people will be just easy to just kind of keep using it, overusing it without realizing that you're actually going to even up the laundry. So that was the specific thing that we're trying to say. But that's what like, addresses that because you can have like a series of things and you don't have to come back to the main thread to coordinate those series of <coughs> what can happen in a thread pool by themselves. Right, and the browser can decide right. to actually keep some threads for itself. We deleted the prototype for that, right? Yeah. yeah. I think you just removed it, it just not that running, long ago. So yeah, 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 yeah totally. Uh, but we had an actual like SQL plus implementation. Yep. Uh, it seemed like complicated with a lot of task dependency. I mean, so it was doing a bunch of stuff. Like it had a thread pool so it could mm -hmm. spread work across multiple threads. And it was doing all the task <clears> dependency <throat> resolution to try to figure out, to try to co-locate dependencies on a single thread so that we didn't have to pass data back and forth and all that stuff. Um, okay. But it ended up with a much easier to use API than workers are currently, which is kind of one of the other things that, like, workers are really powerful, but you 
have to be sort of a dedicated expert to be able to make sense of the API. You have to like build all your own scaffolding thing for message routing and stuff like that. Yeah, and, and it, what worries me with workers is that they're independent of the browser thread pool, so you, they can actually steal everything. Uh, they're not. We're not aware of what they like. If they ask for all the ports, then effectively we're fighting. Yeah. So yeah. Even the developer thinks they still hold it right? We talked about the idea of posting it all around the browser thread pool. Okay. It shouldn't be that difficult. I guess we could find the evidence that the person is a big problem. Can I suggest that actually people like? Yeah. Yeah, welcome. I guess, I guess I'll, I'll step down. This is not about multi threading, so I was just wondering. We'll go back to my threads because it's on our long term. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah I, I think this discussion can be really open to anything. Um, yeah. I put some ideas out there, but I don't have anything prepared for this. So I just thought we'd. Any QA is, is fair game. Did you feel like that? That is our team's work, so that's totally okay. Great. Yes, I don't have paper, but yeah. Uh, I've got a quick question. Yeah. Can you give like a one sentence summary of signal based post tests? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I do have backup slides. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the idea here um, so task queues represent one way that you can specify a relationship between tasks. Um, and signals are another way that you can represent a relationship between tap. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with a board controller in the in the platform. Um, so there was a question a long time ago, and Dominic's here, who worked a lot on this. Um, when we have fetch, fetch return to promise, how do you cancel it, right? And the solution that they came up with was you have a separate object that's a controller. Oh, like a handle. Yep. Yeah, it, it, it provides a handle, which is the signal. Right. And the signal is a basic, like it's kind of like an observer pattern impl pattern implementation. So if I give you a signal, you can now observe events like like from this controller. So if I hit a port, it now anything that has that signal can act on that. Uh, so one of the operations that we were gonna support when this was originally task, task queue based, which modeled very closely after Blink Scheduler, um, was the ability to cancel a task, right? So I might, do taskbot cancel, and that's going to dequeue it. Um, so, when we were thinking about tasks, we were thinking about task queues, and we we're thinking, you know, it's more of a looser coupling, right? With with task queues, you can use it for a tighter coupling. But you think Blink Scheduler, like there's a task type, right? And the task type will map to a task queue. Um, not exactly the implementation, but like this is how. User space schedulers might use this. I might have a task queue for logging tasks, for analytics tasks, or something, right? There's a coupling, but it's not necessary that every task in that task queue should get, you know, canceled together, should get acted upon together. Um, signals to me, you, now you can represent, um, I have a picture of this. You could build a task queue with signals, controllers. Um, basically, you know, anything that you share a, a signal with now becomes like part of a virtual task queue um, because I can change its priority and cancel them all together. I can perform group operations, right? And that's what task queues allow us to do. Um, so, like, the signals, when you have a shared signal, is just another way of grouping tasks together. They're very similar, but this one already exists in the platform. So there was some debate back and forth on whether or not, you know, which approach should be used. Um, I don't think signals are really good at modeling task queues. Um, I think task queues are better at modeling task queues. I think as far as, like, <laughs> right, <laughs> task queues uh, provide ordering. Signals don't provide ordering. Um, but they're good at grouping things. And where task queues aren't so good at, in my opinion, is when you have you know, the, the web's model of tasks, where I might run a task, it starts running, it spawns a bunch of other async work. Um, this stuff's not queued anymore. This has now started running. Task queue's not the best extraction if I want to work with that. Um, so we can think about, you know, we can think about tasks once they start running as a task graph. Um, so it might spawn some subtasks, and these are a tighter coupling. Um, they can, these subtasks might not even necessarily be related in type, uh, but they're tightly coupled. Like their fate 
it all lives and dies together. Like I might want to prioritize them all together and cancel them all at the same time. And that's where sharing a signal comes in with the board. Now those tasks don't have to necessarily even be post-test tasks. They can be fetch. Um, a board controller and signal are already used um, other places in the platform, geolocation stuff, I think. Like a bunch of async work can share this. Um, and what signals allow you to do, at least conceptually, is you know give some sort of notification of an event. Um, two events that we're working on are priority and cancel a board um, and propagate that everywhere. And what's nice about signals compared to task queues is we can't put fetch in our task queues, like these user space task queues. You know, it's not maybe quite the right abstraction for that, um, but they already it already takes a controller. So we could propagate, in theory, priority changes um, using the same, you know, shared signal. So that's kind of the idea there. Do you have a code example of this? Could you show oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, I feel like that would help. It, it sounds more complicated than it is. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. And do you have one that, like, where you actually call something on? The not in these slides. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, OK. Yeah. Just, yeah. Task controller dot abort. Task controller dot set priority. Um, I have a, there's like a, a six, Explainer that I started working on that has more examples of this. Um, and we were planning on sugaring this too, um, so that you could say like post subtask and it would automatically inherit the signal, the current signal. Um, another way to think about this, and they are logically equivalent, is if for this outer task, I create a new task queue and any tasks that are generated along the way go into that task queue, like a subtask queue. Um, specifically for this task. And that that's where, like, I guess this idea of tighter coupling comes in. It's like the task queues are just associated with this task. So now if I want to abort a bunch of things, I would have to do, like, you know, I would clear that task queue of, of these, like, three subtasks. And I would also have probably have another abort controller that cancels, like, related fetches. Um, but here I could just do it all in one shot with the same controller. It doesn't mean that there aren't room for doing task queues also. Um, I just think they come up a little bit short when trying to model this. And once we started sharing this with web developers, they were just kind of like, like at least the, the few that we've shared this with, um, have been like, oh yeah, that just like kind of clicks. It makes sense um, as far as how they think about tasks and modeling tasks. Um, planning to present this to the web working group on Tuesday also um, to get a wider you know, set of opinions. But it also helps simplify the API quite a bit. The API shape is a lot simpler. Um, internally, we actually just use task queues. If you have a shared signal, um, and Nate's working on the implementation, I was going to throw it your way pretty soon once we get it cleaned up. But um, we just create a new web scheduling task queue under the hood if you share a signal that is that can alter the priority. And that way, it's efficient to do ish. Any follow up I want to questions? explain for the new people who come in what this session is. <laughs> oh, <laughs> got more people. Um, this is a continuation of our last session, which was talking about scheduling. Um, I gave it a brief overview of APIs that we're working on, and now it's just open to any discussion around scheduling APIs, open problems that we have. Um, I was starting to use the first part of it as follow up QA from the last session. Can we solicit some topics? Sure. Right forward. I think it would be cool to talk about um, third party code, how that would work in scheduling, and uh -huh. um, ranging from accidental to malicious hijacked activity. Do we want to just start with that or collect topics? I don't know the best way to structure this. Um, yeah, any other like topics? That that's a good segue because I just started talking about this uh, at the end of the last session. Are your slides in the um, schedule? Yes. Uh, for the previous session. For the previous session. Yeah, for the previous okay, session. So for folks who weren't here in the previous session, you might want to skim the slides. Uh, 
the previous session in this room. Yeah, I wonder if it's Anything else? Um, the other stuff that we, we had on the list anyways, if we run out of topics from other folks, are um, propagation. I want to say that it's related to how the party is handling the later frames. Mm -hmm. So I'll uh, say for GI frames uh, that can squeeze each other. Okay. <laughs> Basically, should be should the scheduling be per frame? A document or a group of related documents. I think there's also a um, sort of a sub thing of handling third party, but um, you mentioned it in your talk. The we know a subframe is lower priority. Mm -hmm. We can sort of shift all of it down to mm -hmm. what that would actually look like. Um, it seems like there's a huge design space there. Yep. When you say subframe, you mean I'm um, same. Um, no, no, I mean, uh, yeah, I don't know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Same origin, cross origin. Okay. They both seem potentially relevant. Yeah. I think cross origin is much easier mm -hmm. because you don't have sleep kit, um, or sleep script to access. You by design have opportunity to do all the stuff. If you... The interesting one is cross origin, same process. Because if it's UPIF, like if it's not a process, then... I mean, even if it's the same process, you can do all the stuff. So exactly. This, that's the interesting case, if, uh, is what I meant. Like the... I would say this, that's the easy case. Yeah. Okay. So the, the hard mm -hmm. thing... I think even that easy case is not that easy. It's... There's a huge design space even for the easy case. I'm just going to say in I'm sorry. I mean, there is... It's easy to do that. The hard problem is when you do that. Mm -hmm. um, if, we're, if we're interested in hearing, I can share a little bit about how at Facebook we use our scheduler, not just to like prioritize work, but in some yeah. cases, um, we're able to use some clever wins to uh, speed up loading by doing less work overall just by having the scheduler. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good mm -hmm. use case we didn't touch on, on the first Okay, yeah, that would be interesting. We'd like to hear more about that. Okay, that'd be great. Mm -hmm. And again, this is um, just like for your own. I mean, thread, first party stuff, how you are scheduling between yeah. that. Any topics from you? Okay, let's start with this list. Um, let's start with Benoit's yeah. overview. Yeah. Of um, so, so without going too much into the details of React and concurrent mode and suspense, because I'm not sure the audience is very familiar with it, um, one, one trade off we have to make without a scheduler is when we begin the rendering, if we know we, know we don't have the data, we can either wait until we have all the data to begin rendering uh, the website with React. Or we can start to render while we're missing the data. And so what we found, um, like, in, in, like one, one thing we want to do is we want to start rendering as early as possible for the first meaningful paint. Um, but one, one thing that we care about is, is the sooner we start rendering, the sooner we start warming the JavaScript. But if we start that too early, we run a situation where the data, the loading data comes in shortly after. And what we found in profiles is, is this was happening quite frequently. We would begin to render, but a short while later, um, the data would come back. Um, the way we send data on the load is through the HTML document, an approach called big type. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, what we're able to do with, with the loading task that actually buys up hundreds of milliseconds on startup is we begin the rendering, and by the um, if, if, if what we deem to be a loading task comes in, we switch that to be a high priority so that um, it will, the, our scheduler will yield to um, the browser's XHR or um, document response. And so in our case, it's, it's, it's data coming through that we need to render the page. So if that loses the race, React will render a loading state. 
But uh, what we find frequently is once we begin the rendering, that data shows up in the meantime before we actually try to access the data. So from the perspective of the rendering, it's, it's, it's as if the data was there from the beginning. Um, and so, so we're able to let the, the browser task through for, for, the, for the initial event. We're also, oh, we also let the task through for our, um, for, for Relay GraphQL, which lets us put the data into the cache as well with our scheduler. Um, so yeah, we're receiving uh, several hundred milliseconds when just from prioritizing the, um, the, the data we're receiving. Yeah, basically fetch responses, right? Yes, exactly. Okay, so you have like sort of a network scheduler abstraction. Yes. So everything comes through like you know the layer that that's probably doing the fetches and putting priorities on things, and then as the responses come in, they are in some sort of a queue. Or well, so, like, and it, so so um, to go into more details, like what what happens when you load Facebook.com is is we'll have is we're going to have preloaders, so we. As soon as you hit the server, we'll know exactly what data your, the React components are going to need. And so we'll start generating those right away. And then we'll send down the code for the rendering to the website. And so those two are racing each other. Sometimes the code wins, but usually, um, sometimes the data wins. Usually the code will win. And so what we do is we just kick off the rendering right away. Um, and so in, in this case, the loading task that we need just receives the response and just puts it puts it in the cache with the key. Key is basically just a query name, and so when the rendering code tries to access the data using the query name, um, if we're able to prioritize the loading task, just like in, in this case, we're not really for our case, we're not worried about starvation. We know that task is really quick. Um, it's basically just uh, a, a set, and so yeah, when we yield back to the rendering work, um, it will see the, the key there and use that. Data. Okay. Um, have you found any problems with like, I mean, you can only prior, you can't prioritize the browser as part of handling the fetch responses. So you can only have to like kind of wait for it yeah. to come in user space. It, uh, has that been a problem or? In our case, no, because okay. what, what we're doing is we're doing like, um, like we, we react is yielding to the browser. Um, in, in our case with our scheduler, um, the, the way it's implemented right now is we yield to the browser, but we don't yield to our own task. Once you start React rendering, um, yeah, like the, like in, in, in our case, what would happen is the, without prioritizing this, the XHR would come through since we are yielding to the browser, but it would get stuck in, in our own user space scheduler. Um, so that was preventing the task from being set. But like in, in, in a world where we'd be using the browser scheduler, mm -hmm. we would still want to prioritize things the same way. Which could it should still be able to get that same benefit. It could be. Is it currently recast the browser to like how you call back or is it depending when you need to recast the browser? Are we using, yeah, so we're using is it preventing the error available for a second time there on the back? Yield back the browser in 15 milliseconds. On startups, since we're getting full JavaScript code, usually like our first React render pass is hundreds of milliseconds. And so like the first 100 milliseconds are spent rendering kind of the skeleton of the page, and those those we intentionally um, make sure the product engineers are not using any data in there for other reasons, not just for, not just performance, but yeah, to, to, just to make sure we can get to the loading state without using the data. Uh, but yeah, like our, our frame deadline is basically every 15 milliseconds. So for rendering hundreds of milliseconds, we're gonna yield back to the browser several times before we get to React performance. So I was thinking about this a little bit earlier too, um, and this kind of corroborates my concern, is that if we don't allow you to have fetch priorities from the beginning and you start using the native scheduler, um, currently fetch completions might be our normal priority, default priority in the browser. Um, so if the React scheduler decides to start using high priority um, and it's yielding, but it's yielding and returning at high priority, it could starve out the fetches unless we do something different in the scheduling layer. Um, so it's something to look at, like look at when we start like testing and origin trialing this is whether or not like we actually see like performance um, degradation because of this. One thing I was thinking about um, that we might be able to do from the scheduling perspective is if we don't, 
if we shift down our priorities, like instead of high priority mapping to the scheduler's high priority, right? Like we map that to like normal priority. Um, but then we also downshift other methods of scheduling, right? So that fetches and things like that bubble up and become like either equal to high priority. Um, you know, if, if, if high becomes normal, but we shift down other things is basic idea. So that way we don't have the starvation problem. Um, I think that's one reason it's important, as I mentioned in the previous talk, that we leave flexibility for the browsers to be able to, you know, if we rigidly specify how the priorities work between themselves, but let browsers be able to reorder fetches and stuff in between as we see fit, um, I think that gives us flexibility to try to get this right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, overall, I mean, I didn't really get an impression that you were really wanting, like you're willing to just try out this first, like, you know, post task and support in, the, in your scheduler, or were you making a case for why there should be such priorities, or you want to, like, more network scheduling? Um, yeah, I, I was, I, um, I, I, I haven't worked directly on the scheduler, I've just been okay. using it for the loading task, and so I just wanted to share that, like, mm -hmm. um, if you use it correctly, um, you're not just shifting around work, but you can avoid situations where mm -hmm. um, you have data available, but it's stuck further back in the queue. Like what I was seeing when I was using I see. Chrome yeah. developer tools is, is I was seeing we were, what kind of took me off is I saw that we were putting a, a loading state. And I was like, why are we putting a loading state? And like, just to throw numbers out there, like five seconds into the, the loading sequence when we receive the data at two seconds. Like we've had this data for a long time. Why are we putting the loading state saying we're missing that data? Mm -hmm. So yeah, just just like making sure that um, yeah, for like if you have a long rendering and the, the data comes in, the scheduler can um, improve performance by by making sure the data can make it while you're in the middle of a render. And that can happen with uh, concurrent mode because you are chunking and not just doing the full render. Exactly. So yeah, my fear, uh, and just to kind of say again what I was saying, like if if that concurrent mode decides to run those tasks, to, if the React scheduler schedules as a high priority because it's loading, we want to make sure that stuff gets rendered right away. Um, there's a potential that we lose that benefit, um, be, and that depends on the relative priority between um, what React posted rendering tasks at and what the browser thinks fetch priorities are. And without an explicit notion, if we have an explicit notion of priority on fetches and you say, yes, we actually are waiting for this data, it's really important, like, um, then it should all work. Um, but I'm a little bit worried about the inner, like, in between. Yeah, yeah it's very important for this, right? Like, in our case, we don't do anything very, we don't typically do anything expensive once the response comes back. We just want the event to get through just to, yep. so that we can receive, in this case, the JSON payload process it. Yep. My question here is whether it would be useful to think about this from a different perspective. So first perspective is that the loading event applies to early, too late. The second is we start rendering it, rendering too early. But, uh, giving websites uh, ability to say that they are not ready to render because rendering is expensive. And rendering is layout can be sort of pointless if you do, if you modify the DOM and need to do expensive layout again, whether a good primitive would be for the page to say, please don't render now. I know that I have things coming in. I'm waiting for something. Uh, I will modify the DOM, but just don't render it yet. Yeah, that's something what suspense kind of does. Like you render a placeholder state, and then you basically sort of have a way to um, stall for all of the dependencies and um, whatever else you need downstream. And then when everything is ready, like you, you can then do one render. And also React, React rendering isn't quite DOM rendering, right? Like you could be doing processing of your virtual DOM, um, in which case you're not doing that expensive layout yet, an actual rendering, but you, you know, you're preparing for later DOM updates. Yeah, it's a good question whether it, yeah. a use an API would help this. 
because I also saw this example with, I think, large tables, mm -hmm. when we are lo loading large tables, Chrome does way too, uh, a lot of rendering. So it does, I don't know, 200 milliseconds worth of rendering, and then 500, uh, 5 milliseconds worth of loading task of chunk, which invalidates the rendering and requires another 200 milliseconds worth of rendering, and so on. Cool. Can we move on to the next topic? Sure. Just editing third parties. Yeah, this is a big one. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is yeah, this is complicated and something that comes up a lot. Um, regard, I, any other web devs in the room, I'd be curious to hear like other personal experiences on this. Um, but we've heard this from multiple people. Um, you, you have some third-party script or components adding to your page, and we have no control over them. Um, so in a world where everything cooperates and understands how important they are on the page, um, shared notion of priority can be helpful, um, but that's not going to probably be the common thing. Um, there's a lot of cases where, you know, even, for instance, like, uh, Airbnb has an example. They embed Google Maps on the page, not in an iframe, but just with the script. Um, and they can't really express how important that is. So they're both running their schedules independently, and they might post tasks, you know, at a priority that they think is appropriate for their, you know, for Google Maps, but it might not be based on what the user is interacting with. Um, and we don't really have. You know, with perfect coordination, yes, maybe priorities can can help here. Um, and if you have control over everything, they certainly will. Um, but it's not going to solve all the problems. And, and adding, you know, priorities, and this is the other, like, the malicious case that I think Nicole pointed out is, yeah, what happens if you add some script? It doesn't know any better, and it just starts adding, you know, it posts everything at high priority, because why not? Um, so it's a common question that comes up, and we've been thinking about a bunch um, about how to mitigate those situations. Yes. So you said that it's not an iframe. Yes. Google Maps so, has an API that lets you just. So it's part of this. Does it add in the document? I think it's an API endpoint. Yes. So you just load the script as a part of the document. Yeah. They, they had other examples of this too, like where they would do this for like a third party European cookie notice. Yeah. Um, that but also could cause, you know, some performance problems. Yeah, other peers here. Yeah, so in general, I think we have two overarching problems. Number one is uh, third parties not doing things in an async way, so they just do a bunch of long tasks, and we have no mm -hmm. So once, you know, if we use idle callback and a third party task starts, it just goes on for a period of time, and we can't, like, chunk it up by weekend. Um, and the other aspect of it is the, the thing that you were alluding to, which is things like maps can get important if the user is interacting. So how do we suddenly now prioritize that third party because we want to like make that interactive and more sort of faster than our own? Mm -hmm. so those are the two big problems that we face. I think the the long task thing, um, there's not much, at least as far as what our work is, is doing. I think there's other work that can help with that, um, which go to uh, Kintaro's talk on multiple, multiple main threads. threads. There's a couple different approaches that people are exploring um, to try to do different types of sandboxing, but I believe they both require iframes. Yes? I guess yes. that's, um, if I could ask a follow up question. Yeah. Uh, do we know if they have a good reason not to use iframes? Of the maps? Reading some posts about this. So, I mean, yeah, basically. Performance. The way it works is that people embed a bunch of scripts in their page, yes. right? And those are the entry points. Like I put my, my tag manager and my, and my club ads and a whole bunch of stuff. And then those will first get try to get a bootstrap script and then downstream maybe create an iframe. So it's a mix of both. So you'll get so there'll be some script on directly and then there'll be some, and then they will create spawn off iframes and that will be it's both. Can we do like uh, isolation of a task, which itself cannot pose 
a higher branch of us? Um, I a think higher than it's ever. I think yes. Um, it's not built. Um, I have like a little couple page explainer on this, and um, it's what I was alluding to at the end of the talk. I think. Um, I think we can virtualize the window.scheduler concept to other bits of code um, to do that. Um, the important thing is that it won't be impervious to long tasks. Um, it just can't be. Right. Like, so I have this like idea I've been working on called lightweight priority sandboxing. Um, and uh, let me slide. Um, so like imagine if so, okay, yeah, I guess there's like three levels of isolation. Um, process isolation, like UPIFs, and then like that and thread are very similar. Like they give you the same kind of like, we're gonna use multiple threads in order to have the operating system help us give some sort of isolation. And those can do help with, with long tasks. Um, stuff that we're thinking about, I mean, it's one main thread, so it's a shared main thread. So we're talking about something that's sub thread. Right, it's going to still be shared, but as you alluded to, we want to try to control some script ability to be able to use higher priorities. Right. Um, I think that we can do. We have um, so I guess there's a doc link on here. Uh, the like basic overview is like if we can if we can establish of this virtual scheduler. So we instantiate a new window dot scheduler. It has its own um, not window dot scheduler, like just a scheduler. So we have a new instance of a scheduler. It has its own high default low task queues. Okay. Um, if I have two such things, I have instance A and instance B, it has its own set of shared task queues. Like the blink scheduler can doesn't have to make those all the same priority. We can, you know, we can drop those. Like as long as we know a policy, we have to know some sort of policy. So if I have scheduler A that has the policy that says it's low priority, if I have scheduler B that's you know normal priority, we can treat them differently internally. Um, you know the the first boundary that's you know in this picture is like iframes. It's a very clear boundary, and we already have good isolation there. So you know it would be easy to establish some sort of policy. Um, other ones, but I think you can extend that idea. I think, you know, let's say when you load a script, you give it a tag that's like scheduling policy equals low, something like that. Um, then when that script starts running, any tasks that it posts goes into its own, you know, sandbox scheduler. Right. The key is that you need to then propagate that to any tasks that might run as a result of that. Um, so you kind of have to, to glue that to the tasks that has to go across micro, micro task boundaries, Event handlers, like all kinds of things. So, so we, so we've done, we've done something like this for performance. Okay. We call it continuation tra tracing. Okay. And we've had two different projects to implement it. And so, what we found, um, and, and so it's not quite the same use case, but it's similar. Like what, what we do is, is, is we're going to say like, oh, like you're on a mouse down, and you're starting an interaction, and we track the continuations. Mm -hmm. And we'll say like this was for low, this was for a tail load, a, a page switch, things like this. Um, what we find is that there's there's a lot of parts in the code that want to perform some kind of batching. It, you know, it kind of feels similar to what the browser does with style and layout. Like they they um, and and so what will happen is one piece of code will will get to one of this module and we'll set a dirty bit and then we'll we'll schedule a task and say okay we need to trigger React rendering mm -hmm. let's say. So in this case, this continuation is is within the context of a low priority. So React will schedule a low priority render. Oh, cool. And and, and we'll, well, well, like in, in, in your case, I guess, right? Like, because it would come from low priority tasks, mm -hmm. right? schedule a low priority React render. Mm -hmm. So that works well. But when, when it starts to break down, is when another update comes through with a high priority context. And now the dirty bits has already been set, mm -hmm. and the schedule, uh, the task has already been posted. And so now this high priority render task will not reschedule itself. Um, and, and that's just kind of from the user code. Like mm -hmm. in this case, like you would need the user code to be very aware and very sensitive. So for performance monitoring, we started adding a lot of like players and like actually on for this priorities and things like that. And um, we found that it didn't work well and we had to switch approach. Um, I'm happy to give you more details. Yeah, that'd be great to, yeah, to hear about. So it's, yeah, it's basically a wrapping um, 
everything and kind of propagating yeah. their contents. We even tried it in two approaches. The first approach was just kind of at the browser level, like we were like on the old, and this was on the old side, and we were like tracking all the set timeouts, and, and we were kind of wrapping all the all the things at the browser at the browser boundary. Our second approach was tracking it at the React boundaries. Mm -hmm. So, because um, that's usually when we come in and out of product code. Mm -hmm. So we knew uh, what were all the contexts for the product code. But what we found is on the majority of our traces, um, like startup and payloads get mixed up together. Um, they, um, so yeah, the, the context here is a bit different, but I think you'll run into the same set of problems. And, and when we were finding that these problems were happening the majority of the time. I think you follow up the show. Yeah, and yeah, certainly. Yeah. More about that because it's not that the concept was the it was basically like there were other it was just causing other patterns mm -hmm. and therefore not because it was hard to literally implement. No, it, right. It's it's easy to implement. The, yeah. the right the, the the main problem is that like if you if, if you like uh, to put this in terms of like the the browser let's say right like you you have the style system. Where the first person makes a style modification, you basically say, at least that's my naive understanding, is, is you say, oh, well, style, styles is dirty. And then in this case, you would say, well, it's done by a task that's low priority. So it's low priority to update the styles. Mm -hmm. And so um, then later, if someone makes a style modification, you've already posted a task to, um, to, to generate this new frame, and you've already posted it as a low task. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it would be coming from a high priority context. Um, so, so like in this case, when you when you have the style resolution, it becomes really hard to say like like what priority do you do you, do you run it at, um, and like yeah yeah interesting um, yeah I think it'd be great to think about all the use cases where this could break down and ones where it could be successful. Um, you accidentally covered a topic. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, and to this this like this builds off of work that we're already doing for propagation, um, because for the signal based approach we talked about, we do want to be able to propagate that signal across the async boundaries so that you can do you know just inherit the priority. Like if you're in a fetch completion and that was scheduled at high priority, then like tasks it posts can go <laughs> high priority too. Um, so we can build off of some of that some of that work propagation, which sounds like what you kind of did too. Um, I think we're up against yeah, lunch, yeah. Um, so I am here two days, happy to talk about scheduling as much as anybody else wants to. <laughs> okay, thank you.